is not for his eternal man. Wake up and see the time is full, the great exchange has come. The Son of God stands in our place, the Father's will is done. One day, Peter and John went to the temple at three o'clock in the afternoon, the hour for prayer. There at the beautiful gate, as it was called, was a man who had been lame all his life. Every day, he was carried to the gate to beg for money from the people who were going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John going in, he begged them to give him something. They looked straight at him, and Peter said, look at us. So he looked at them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said to him, I have no money at all, but I give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I order you to get up and walk. Then he took him by his right hand and helped him up. At once the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and started walking around. Then he went into the temple with them, walking and jumping and praising God. The people there saw him walking and praising God, and when they recognized him as the beggar who had sat at the beautiful gate, they were all surprised and amazed at what had happened to him. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We are beginning a series, actually we began it last week, so we continue our series, uh, which will take us through uh, the next several weeks as we think about Pentecost and the birth of the church on the book of Acts. And I've called it Astounding Acts because you will find some of the most astounding stories as the church was birthed in the book of Acts. Something astounding happened at my house yesterday. I thought it was great. Oliver did not think it was great. When Oliver realized that um, he and I have the same size jeans. <laughs> as I said, I think that's great. And probably not so much. <laughs> One of my favorite places on the entire planet is a place in my home state of South Australia called Thuruna. And Thuruna is a Uniting Church of Australia campsite. And there are camps held at Thuruna all through the year, much like we have Little Grassy and Jensen Woods and other camping sites that the United Methodist Church controls in the Illinois Great Rivers Annual Conference. But Thuruna is an important place for me. It lies near the tip of the Eyre Peninsula, halfway between the towns of Tumby Bay and Port Lincoln. And Port Lincoln was the place that I first began this crazy journey of pastoral ministry. Thuruna is an Australian Aboriginal word, and it means together by the sea. And I want to share with you just some photos this morning of this place that was so formative in my early Christian years. You've already seen that picture taken from the boat looking back across the water into the campsite. But there's a picture from the beginning of the bay where the campsite actually is. But if you keep going with the pictures, you'll find this picture. This place holds for me <coughs> incredible meaning. It's right in front of the dormitories. Every year, I would go on an Easter camp growing up. And every Easter Sunday morning, we would have silent communion. And by silent communion, we would all get out of bed around 6 o'clock in the morning before the sun rose. And the sun rose right over the bay in front of that cross. And we would gather out the front of the Thuruna campsite <coughs> in silence. And the minister would begin to enact the meal of communion. And then as the sun hit the ocean and we were ready to take the elements, we would begin singing, Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. As that sun, if you could imagine, it would hit the edge of that water and the water would become orange and pink. And the beautiful colors of sunrise would just flood that entire place. There's another picture too of the beach as it extends past the Runa campsite. The beach is actually probably two to three times longer than this. You just see the first curve. But you can walk that beach for miles. And it truly is one of the most beautiful places that I've ever spent time with, spent time at in my life. Because Australia still has many public holidays across the Easter long weekend, kids tend to go away for camp where I grew up, to this campsite, the Thuruna Easter Camp. We had some marvellous times together as teenagers at the Thuruna Easter Camp. We used to give breakfast in bed to any of the campers who didn't get up on time. Let me explain to you what breakfast in bed is. You're probably thinking, that's really lovely. That some teenagers would give people breakfast in bed. No, 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 no. This was breakfast in bed. If you didn't get up at the appointed time, and then you got a second warning, and you didn't get up at the second warning, you would be visited with breakfast in bed. One whole box of cornflakes, one half gallon of milk, and it would be dumped all over you and all over your bed at the same time. But what happens when the minister doesn't get up, even after the cornflakes and the milk has been dumped on the sleeping bag? Well, a group of teenagers will grab that sleeping bag by all four corners, walk it out of the dormitory, down onto this beach, and that morning, the minister got rebaptized. <laughs> that was the same Easter camp 
that we actually stole the minister's underwear and froze it in big gallon buckets in water. So when he needed to find underwear, he needed an ice pick and some sun and maybe a hairdryer to, uh, yeah, the things we did as kids. Is it any wonder, knowing me now, how I found some of my formative Christian experiences at this campsite? But I loved Easter camp. There was one person that made Easter camp, Easter camp. And her name was Sheriff Van Houston. She was a legend in the area where I grew up as someone who loved to care for, in the name of Jesus, anybody that she came across, especially teenagers. And for many years she ran that Easter camp. She lived nearby in that town called Tumby Bay. She used to live in Port Lincoln earlier than that. She ran a home for underprivileged kids there. She had two of her own children, Matthew and Alida, but Matthew sadly died in infancy. But Sheriff's whole life was about caring for others in the name of Jesus. And she had an open door policy at her house. The front door was never locked. And teenagers could come and go as they pleased. She was a rather amazing woman. She went through, as many of us go through, some of her own trying times. She went through a difficult divorce. She found herself on her own in her 40s. But instead of letting that just push her aside and cause her to think, I don't belong and I can't care for people, she just doubled down on her efforts of caring for people in the name of Jesus. In her early 50s, she moved from Tumby Bay to the city of Adelaide, which is the capital city in my state, so she could move in with her brother to become her brother's full-time carer. Cameron, who was uh, younger than Sheriff, has Down syndrome, and he was able to move out of a group home and in with his sister to be cared for. Several years ago, it was whilst I was still living in Tennessee, Sheriff called me. She said, Mike, I want you to pray for me. I've been having some pain on my left side, so I'd like you to pray for me. I encouraged her to go to see a doctor. She went, no, 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 I don't need no doctor. I'm fine. I, I just pulled a muscle or something. Just, just pray for me. Okay. But she called back a few weeks later. It was uncommon for Sheriff to ask others to pray for her or help her. She was the one that wanted to do that for other people. But she called me again, and when she called me again to say that that pain had gotten stronger, I got real worried. I encouraged her to see a doctor. She told me, no, she really doesn't need to see a doctor. But she did go to see a doctor. And she was too late. They confirmed end-stage liver cancer. And just a few weeks after her diagnosis, Sheriff was dead. And it wasn't fair. A woman in her early 50s and suddenly she was gone. This woman was a giant in the kingdom of God and suddenly she wasn't there anymore. She had shepherded hundreds of young kids, including me, and has left a legacy of faith all over the world. But she was dead far too soon and far too early. And it doesn't seem right that a servant of God, one who pours their entire life into caring for the least and the lost and the young and the stupid, that's the category that I put myself in, would be taken like that from such an insidious disease. Several years ago, right after my son had died, I was asked to pray for someone who also had cancer. I'd never met this person, but I was asked to meet with them and pray with them. I didn't want to. And I didn't want to because I was fragile and broken myself. I was struggling myself with the idea of can God even heal? Can God even intervene anymore? Because if God could intervene, surely God could have intervened a few weeks ago and not allowed my own child to die. I felt defeated in that time. And I did not want to pray for this woman. 
She was not a Christian. She had lost most of her life savings by visiting crystal healers and shamans and spiritualists, trying to find a cure and paying people for it. But that cure never came. I didn't want to rob her of yet another cure. So I sat this lady down and for a good 20 minutes I explained to her why God doesn't heal anymore. I told her that God always heals the heart and the mind and the emotions, but God doesn't heal us physically anymore. It's over Red Rover. Because I'm thinking if God can still heal physically, then God would have healed my own child. I didn't want her to feel robbed of yet another cure or let down. I knew that the book of James calls for oil to be used in healing prayer. But there was no oil in this house except for sewing machine oil. Now that stuff is just nasty. But I used it anyway. A small dab on my finger and a mark on her forehead. And what followed was not a wonderfully oratory of prayer. It was just a few words that jumbled out of my mouth that held, I believe, no conviction, that held no real understanding of faith in that moment. Just look, God, if you want to, if you feel like it. Amen. When our eyes opened, I watched this woman change. I watched her skin change color. I watched new skin grow in the places where this horrendous cancer she had was showing through. And I remember thinking, <laughs> what is happening? I was astounded beyond measure. Because remember, I've just spent 20 minutes saying God doesn't heal anymore. She went to her doctors that week. No cancer, no stage four, just healthy. You want to meet someone who met Jesus that day? You've got to meet that lady, let me tell you. But why? I keep coming back to that question of why. Why does a woman like Sheriff lose her life? Someone who loves God. Someone who works on behalf of Jesus, furthering the kingdom of God. Why does God not work with her, but heals a woman who doesn't have a relationship at that point with Father, Son and Holy Spirit miraculously? It leads me to the question, how much faith is enough faith? How much prayer is enough prayer? But if it was all about the strength of a person's faith... It should have been the person who didn't know God that died and the woman who loved God that lived. But you know, I can tell you hundreds of stories of people of great faith who have experienced in their lives terrible tragedy. And just as many stories I can tell you of people with hardly any or no faith whatsoever, but have seen God move in supernatural and astounding ways. As you know, the world can be a bizarre place, and the internet can be even bizarrer. Don't believe everything you find on the internet, is what Abraham Lincoln once wrote in his diary. <laughs> a couple of years ago, an acquaintance of mine, not a person that I know well, an acquaintance of mine who is from South Africa wrote a bizarre blog that I came across, like a diary entry online. She wrote of her extremely crazy belief that you can't be a Christian and have a disease. In case you didn't hear me right, this person believed that if you were a true Christian, you would never, ever, ever get sick. I am incapable of not opening my mouth at times like this. I had to reply, 
In a nutshell and a paraphrase, what I said was, that is the biggest load of mm, I've ever heard in my life. And what happened next was truly bizarre. Long, ranting replies from people who began to attack me and use scripture out of context to say that I was about the most horrible, heathen, unbiblical, heretic, blasphemous pastor and person they'd ever met. And then this, I copy and pasted this so I could keep it. I command Satan to release the mind of Mike Grayson. You spirit of the Antichrist, come out of him in the name of Emmanuel. So if nothing else, move over Henry Kissinger. There's a new candidate for Antichrist in town. He's a United Methodist minister in Granite City, Illinois, and he's Australian. Who would have thought that a kid who grew up in the Outback, which is not a restaurant, by the way, who would have thought that a kid that grew up in the Outback could actually be the arch nemesis of Christianity? Well, I responded, and really I shouldn't have, but I did, with a resigned comment along the lines of, no matter what has been said, I will continue to love people who are sick and share the message of Jesus with people that I come into contact through word and through action. And I will continue to walk in the valley of the shadow of death as it is encountered. And then a sarcastic quip, not that I could be sarcastic, of course. None of you would ever believe that at me. Uh, but then a sarcastic quip at the end that said, and later on tonight I shall, I shall throw out my insulin pump and run over it with a minivan. It's hard to convey tone on the internet. <laughs> The same guy who called me the Antichrist returned with this. Hallelujah! Mike Rayson has been set free. <laughs> Praise Jesus that he has delivered Mike Rayson from the spirit of the Antichrist. <laughs> this person actually believed me when I said, and later on tonight I'll throw out my insulin pump and run over it with a minivan. You know, this kind of Christianity is the kind of Christianity that leaves me with the creeps. The whole idea that you will never get sick when you've got Jesus. Or it also manifests itself like this. You will be super rich if you have God on your side. Just send $500 to this address. Seed money. And God will send you back a half a billion. It's crass. It's wrong. It's heresy. It's blasphemy to believe this of our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If the Protestant church were to give out sainthoods, I would suspect Sheriff would be at the head of the line. In many ways, this woman is responsible for pushing me into a life dedicated to ministry and service. Yet according to those false teachers I encountered, she could not have been a follower of Jesus. She got cancer and died. To believe that disability means you have stepped outside of God's will because you've not been healed yet, means that my friend, the Reverend Dr. Glenn Barnett, who as a young man in the town of Port Lincoln, dove off the pier into 12 inches of water, and therefore has been since 15 a quadriplegic, is headed for the fires of hell because he's not got up out of that chair since. He's now a retired Uniting Church minister and also one of the world's most celebrated mouth painters. But even more amazingly, God has used my friend Glenn all over Australia and the world in a healing ministry. This man has prayed for people and watched as God's Holy Spirit has healed them of disease and disability, yet he's unable to step up from his own wheelchair. It's kind of like the story of Joni Erickson Tada, who has been called to a similar ministry as Glenn has had. She too has never gotten up out of her wheelchair. And then there's the prophet Elisha. Elisha followed Elijah. It was Elisha that prayed for a double portion of Elijah's ministry be given to him by God. It was Elisha and through Elisha that God multiplied the oil in the bottom of a poor woman's jar. 
enough for her to sell to pay off her debts and provide for her family. It was through Elisha that Naaman, the Syrian general, was instructed to bathe in the river several times and was cured by, from leprosy. It was Elisha that upon learning that the water supply in Jericho was bad, threw salt into the water and prayed and miraculously that water was perfect to drink. It was Elisha too that we read about in 2 Kings in the 13th chapter. And this is exactly what the scripture says. One sentence. Now Elisha was suffering from the illness from which he died. Hang on a minute. If a follower of God doesn't get sick, here we have a giant of faith. Who did and died from whatever that illness was. Our Jesus simply says this, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Being a Christian does not mean you get Jesus as a kind of talisman thrown in for good measure. Jesus is not a holy charm or some kind of religious band-aid. The very incarnation of God is not a get-rich-quick scheme by sending your money into some strange preacher in the hope that that preacher will be able to petition God to send back more money so you can live an exciting, rich life. God is so much more than that. To believe God is contained into get-rich-quick schemes and get-healed-quick schemes is to disrespect and blaspheme the nature of who God is and what God is doing in the world. In this world, friends, as I reinterpret this piece of scripture, in this world we will encounter sickness and disease and illness and disability. But take heart, because God is in this world. The brokenness of sin and the presence of death means that we will suffer and continue to suffer. Christians do not get a free pass from suffering and from the broken nature of a fallen planet. Now, most of the time, sin and death and suffering and disease doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. You can be the most prayed up, prayerful person on the planet. You can have the largest faith that's ever been seen in the history of Christendom. You can command that a mountain, get up and throw itself into the sea and watch that mountain grow legs and walk and throw itself into the sea. Yet you can also fall ill and suffer with no miraculous or supernatural kind of cure. Or you can be the most immoral person that ever lived, living a life of waste and extravagance, and still encounter a move of God so strong and so amazing that in an instant you find yourself healed and whole and forgiven and free. This stuff really doesn't make sense in my linear kind of mind, in my logic mind. But then logic says that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Logic, according to God, says 1 plus 1 equals whatever I want it to equal today. It doesn't make sense when we apply logic. If this life is all about how much faith you have or how big your belief is, surely God should act in accordance with the amount of sacrifice that you have personally made for the kingdom of God. But it doesn't work like that. And any preacher you hear tell you that it does. Any television preacher that says, send me money now and God will send you money later, is a charlatan and a liar. There is no magic formula for healing. There is no right way to ask God for supernatural intervention. There's probably no wrong way to ask God either. For our rightness and wrongness in the face of God is probably all wrong. But we are instructed as Christians to pray for the sick continually. The book of James tells us this. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Yet despite what we hear from face value in the book of James, we don't know why in this lifetime some of us will succumb to disease and disability and others of us won't. 
Why did God heal the woman I prayed for but not Sheriff? Why does God use a quadriplegic in a wheelchair to pray for the sick and see them miraculously recover, yet can't rise from his own wheelchair? Why did my child die literally days after he made his first confession of faith in Christ Jesus, yet an idiot who believes that some guy from Australia could be the Antichrist somehow misses the lightning bolt that is sure to come from heaven one day directed in his general direction? Probably not, but I like to think so. And I don't have the answers to this, except I know that the experience of a healing miracle has little to do with how much stored up faith we have, whether we vote on the left or on the right, or even how many people we may or may not have talked to about Jesus in this past week. We live in the now, but the not yet. Yet Jesus is here, but many of us don't see this kind of physical healing and won't see it until Jesus comes again. Even though Jesus is with us, yet it is only Jesus who heals our broken bodies and our broken spirits. It's not our fervent prayers, although they're important. It's not our supply of faith. It's not the oil that gets dabbed upon your head. It's not the gift of baptism. It's not even some tangible thing of hope that we try and hold on to. It is Jesus who makes all things new. It is Jesus that gives us the gift of faith, of hope, of trust that heals us and it is only Jesus and the relationship that exists between the Father, Son and Holy Spirit that can make all things new. Whether all things new means physical well-being in this moment or physical well-being for all of eternity. Do I believe personally in supernatural healing in the here and now? You better believe it. If I hadn't have seen it with my own eyes, I may not have believed so. Do I believe that we should pray for those who are sick and anoint with them with oil, believing that God can and sometimes does heal the broken body along with the broken spirit? You better believe that I believe that. But I'm also aware that God's timetable often doesn't match our timetable. I also believe that God's purposes may actually work within our brokenness, our sickness and our diseases. I don't believe that God causes brokenness or sickness or disease, but I know that God takes the worst of human existence and can make something beautiful out of it. It seems appropriate that our gospel story, sorry, it seems appropriate that our story from the book of Acts today took place at a gate called Beautiful. It seems to me the gate was anything but beautiful. Bunch of sick people lying around, hoping and praying some holy person would pass by and help them. And one day, Peter and John did. Peter wasn't much of a holy person. I'm sorry, you go read some stories about Peter. You don't walk away and say, what a holy man he is. The fool got out of a boat and thought, I could walk on the water. And then kind of started looking around and sunk. I went to the Sea of Galilee once, I put my hands on the top. It didn't feel like concrete. My hand went through it. Peter had his foot in his mouth more times than he didn't. Peter and Paul had some terrible arguments about faith and life. Peter was not a very righteous, holy man, yet Peter was one used by God. And when he walked through the gate called Beautiful one day with the Apostle John, and this lame man cried out, Peter looked at him and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Jesus who? In the name of, huh? Of where? We don't even know if this lame man knew who Jesus was. Jesus had been executed some time beforehand. For all the lame man knew, he was just a seditious thief. Someone who stirred the pot a little too much and had the Romans kill him. But there's something in this story that we often miss. Yes, the holy men come by. In the name of Jesus, he's, the lame man is commanded to walk. But something happens between his inability to walk and the dancing in the streets that takes place in the latter part of the story. It's not something I think many of us stop and consider. When the scripture says Peter bent down 
took him by the arm and helped him up off the ground. And then the scripture says that only after Peter had began to help the lame man up, that his ankles and legs grew strong and he began to walk on his own. When we are called to pray for healing, we're called to put friends some skin in the game. Now, Peter and John could have thrown a couple of shekels in the man's cup and said, go buy yourself a Coke, you'll feel better. We're not so much called to send money to people who are sick, although that can be very helpful, and God does cause and ask us to do so from time to time. But we are commanded to get some skin in the game. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power to heal people and set people free in the name of Jesus. But oftentimes that power that comes from Jesus is channeled through the very people of God who are commanded to use it. And those people are not the preachers and the pastors and the bishops and the district superintendents and the lay leaders or whoever else. Those people are not the people that sit on the SPRC or who are on the finance team or who serve the church by doing whatever. Those people are you and me. My prayers don't mean more than your prayers do. God doesn't listen to this Australian preacher any more than he listens to you when we pray. We're just called to pray. And we're called to use physical touch when we pray for our brothers and sisters. For the touch of the master's hand is often felt best through the hands of those that the master has touched. And there at the gate called Beautiful, a man who may not have ever heard of this Jesus character before, the dead guy the Romans killed a little while back, experiences through the touch of Peter the healing power and presence of an almighty God at a gate called Beautiful. But the man of God needed some skin in the game. For it wasn't until he helped him up that his legs and his ankles grew strong. Reminds me of an old Gaither song. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, God understood. All I have to offer, God, is brokenness and strife. God makes something. Beautiful of my life. I have this thing in my pocket. It's my insulin pump because I'm a type 1 diabetic. The name that I've given this blue thing is Forest Pump, by the way. <laughs> and it would be awesome if I could take this pump off and run over it with the Longs minivan later on this afternoon. Hmm. But I'm not going to take it off. Because you know, as many times have I, as I've been prayed for and continue to pray about this illness that I have, it's still my illness. <clears throat> but God has done some interesting things with me through the process of being someone that lives with a major disease. Because through prayer, I have grown far, far stronger than I ever could have hoped to be. This morning, as we finish our time together looking at the power of prayer, scripture, servanthood, and healing, I want to give the opportunity for you to receive prayer for healing yourself, if you so wish. And so, uh, I, I didn't tell Jennifer this, but have some music up your sleeve wherever you've gone. No, Marilyn, have some music up your sleeve wherever you've gone to pray in just a moment. Because for those that wish to come and pray in just a moment at the altar, prayers of healing for either yourself or for someone that you need to come and stand in the gap for. A, a wife, a husband, a child, a friend, a parent. Then come. Allow yourself to be anointed with oil as James talks about. And allow the people of God to gather around you and put some skin in the game to use their hands to pray for you. I'm not going to promise you that God is going to supernaturally heal you in an instant this morning. But I can promise you that God will be at work reconciling the world unto God's self 
in you this morning. Because God is the God of all things new. And it's the book of Revelation when John writes down the vision that he sees that records the words, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Then I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven like a bride adorned for her husband. And then the scripture goes on to say that this new place was a place of no more tears and no more sorrow. And if I could expand on that, no more disease and no more sickness and no more illness and no more wheelchairs and no more quadriplegics and no more insulin dependent diabetics and no more drugs that you have to wake up and take every single morning just to make your body work. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And then at the end of that God tells John to write this, Behold, I am making all things new. And John, here's how I want you to finish that verse. Write these things down, for these words are trustworthy, and these words are true. You'll find that in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. So the answer as you come for prayers of healing this morning may not be right now. They might be not yet. But whatever the answer God might have for you this morning, know that God is in the business of making all things new regardless. Know that God can take the broken pieces and make something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, God understands. Little by little and piece by piece, friends, our brokenness can be put back together. And one day, as we live into the fullness of the eternal life that we have even now, there will be no more Walgreens and no more CVSs, and no more Gateway Hospitals, and no more BJC, and no more health insurance companies trying to take away every dollar you've ever made in your life, and no more copays. Praise Jesus, no more copays. Because God is making all things new, and it begins today. Remember, Jesus said, take heart. You'll have trouble in this world, but I'm here, and I've already overcome it. And so in these next moments, I want to offer the opportunity for you to be prayed specifically for healing in your own life. If you wish to come, as Marilyn plays a little for us, I will anoint your head with oil and invite those of you that wish to also come and pray with me for those that have come. To come and lay your hands and put some skin in the game. Be a Peter. Help folks up. Because it was only when Peter extended his hand that that man's ankles and legs grew strong in the power and in the name of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to do just for a few moments. If you would like to come for healing for yourself, or if you would like to come and stand in the gap for somebody else, come and we'll pray for you. But just because you're sick doesn't mean you can't stay up and pray for the next person means healing because God uses even strange weird people like me to pray for others and I'm as broken down as the next person so let's do that for a moment seems a bit unmethodist doesn't it let's lay hands on folks and invite God to be healing even this moment amen
Hi there, this is Namioki News. If you're visiting with us this morning, then welcome. Every Sunday we have two different services. The 8:15 a.m. service is in a laid-back traditional style, and then at our 10:30 a.m. family service, you'll find worship geared a little more high energy and robust. Whatever service you attend, we hope you're able to truly worship the God who loves you and adores you. Between our services, we have the Sunday school hour. The nursery is open for children during this time and during our 10:30 a.m. service. Our kids will leave the service after the children's message for children's church. This afternoon, youth group will meet at 1 p.m. Dorothy and Jack Lucas have kindly offered to donate their organs to the church. No, wait a minute, that can't be right. Oh yes, I read that wrong. Dorothy and Jack Lucas have a Wurlitzer home organ they would like to donate to a good home in exchange for a $250 gift towards our Africa University mission target. Catch up with them right after the 10:30 a.m. service, or give them a call. You'll find their number in your bulletin. Speaking of Africa University, stiff upper lip, cup of tea and crumpets, and a bad Queen Elizabeth impression. Hello, my husband and I would like to invite you to a high tea at 2 p.m. Thursday, July 16th, in the Fellowship Hall. Tickets are seven dollars. Please purchase them in advance from Millie. Jenny, the New Zealander, she's a subject of mine, don't you know? Donna Kessler, Mary Jo, or Diana. This high tea afternoon will be hosted by the Lydia Circle. God save the um, God save me. Also in your bulletin today is information on the women's barbecue, an invitation to Ravenelli's tomorrow night for the Scouts, and again on Wednesday night for our Bible study. Betty Funk still has cleaning cloths for sale, and there's even information about an upcoming tribute concert to the late great Minnie Pearl at Wilson Park on the 11th of June from 7:30 p.m. We're still looking for VBS volunteers for our Vacation Bible School program that begins on July 26th. See Linda Ames, Patty Lands, or Bev Nance for more details. And remember, if there are not enough volunteers, I will happily just start selecting people at random. Our Mops ministry begins in September of this year. Stay tuned over the next few weeks to Namioki News for more exciting announcements about this and information on ways you can help. The Encounter Youth Choir from Main Street United Methodist Church will be here June the 28th at 6 p.m. Come and hear this amazing 80 voice teenage choir. Kids Capes of Courage is a new ministry of Namioki United Methodist Church that provides superhero capes to sick children and those with special needs to help them feel courageous when they need it most. All children love superhero capes, and many need a little extra courage at difficult times. Anyone can help. You don't have to be able to sew. The most time-consuming part of assembling the capes is actually cutting out the fabric. Patterns and fabric will be provided, and anyone, regardless of age or gender, can attend the informational meeting this coming Wednesday night, June the third, at 7:30 p.m. For more information, see Linda Wozniak. She's in Kentucky today, so maybe just see her next week. The capes are fun and easy to make, and it will take many of us to put together and deliver them. This will be an ongoing ministry of the church, and capes will be delivered to the area children's hospitals on a regular basis. We'll also provide a cape to anyone who requests one for a sick or special needs child. Please prayerfully consider helping us provide a little courage for children facing difficult circumstances. That's it for Namioki News this week. If you have any announcements, please have them to the front office by 10 a.m. each Thursday. Have a blessed day.